over 35 minutes of useless facts and zombies. Let's go. Oh, now this ought to be a good time. Did you know that in zombies, there is a thing called insta-kill rounds? On World at War, on Nocturne, Toten, and Verruckt, it starts at round 163, but in Sheena, Numa, and Darius, it starts a little bit later. On Black Ops 1, the insta-kill rounds start at 163, and if you don't really know what an insta-kill round is, it's basically a bug that reverts the zombie's health. Instead of being the health at 163, they revert back to round 1. So you can literally be well into the hundreds, and the zombie's health will be as if they're on round 1, hence the name insta-kill rounds. They're not literally insta-kill, they still have 150 points worth of health, but it's like you're on round 1, so it essentially is. You can use the MP5K on round 163 and still kill a bunch of zombies. Now the insta-kill rounds aren't permanent. On Black Ops 1, they start at 163 and they appear every other round, and this goes on until round 185. Then after that, it starts to become a little bit more random and sporadic. And like I said, this is not an actual part of the game. This is just a bug that happens once you get to such a high round. And if you want like a full explanation, like going into the actual details of it, I'm going to leave a video in the description that explains it because I'm way too stupid to understand it. And I don't understand like coding and programming. That just makes no sense to me. But if you can understand that kind of stuff, I will leave a link to a video down below in the description so you can go check it out. But insta-kill rounds are definitely something that you really need for high rounds because once you really get up to like 163 plus, rounds are taking well over an hour. So if you add in the insta-kill rounds every other round, it will definitely speed things up so you're not spending hours upon hours just trying to get out of the 160s. Now in the Black Ops 1 Zombies menu, you'll see all these TVs and they'll occasionally flick on and off with different things. One of the bottom TVs will show you five. It'll show some zombies walking down the hallway and Quick Revive. The only thing is, that is actually not where Quick Revive is in the game. When you load up five, Quick Revive is kind of tucked back here in this room, while the TV monitor says that it is in the hallway. So maybe at one point in time, Quick Revive was actually going to be right there in that hallway instead of being tucked away by this red phone. I can see. On Call of the Dead, when you're trying to activate the music easter egg, there's going to be three 115 rocks around the map, and one of them is on the ship. Now you can just go up to it and activate it like normal, but say for some reason you can't activate it normally, if you go one floor up and come right over to this spot, you can still activate the rock even though you're really not in front of it whatsoever. So maybe if you're trying to do some weird speedrun music easter egg, maybe this can somehow help, I, I don't know. The video isn't called useless facts for nothing. Now this next fact it might not be as useless. Zombies health per round. On round 1, zombies will have 150 health points, and every round until round 10, they will gain 100 points. So on round 2, it'll be 250, on round 3, it'll be 350, 4, 450, and so on and so on. But once we get to round 9 and 10, that's when things start to change a little bit. Starting on round 10, the zombies health is going to be multiplied by 1.1 each round. So their health doesn't really raise too much through like the teens and then the 20s, but really once you get to the 30s and 40s, that's when their health really starts to skyrocket up. And then once you get to like the 60s and 70s, it's just way far gone from what any weapon besides a one hit kill wonder weapon can do. So to give you like an example, on round 10, zombies health is going to be 1045, while on round 100, it's going to be 5.5 million. It's actually going to be way more than that, but 5.5 million sounds a little bit better. One thing that really drove the community crazy back in the day was that during the Call of the Dead trailer, at multiple points throughout the trailer, you can see various weapons with random attachments. And leading up to Call of the Dead's release, this made the community really think that at some point we're going to be able to put attachments on weapons. And a lot of people thought that this is what Double Pack of Punching actually ended up giving you. But unfortunately, when the map released, we really quickly learned that we cannot put attachments on weapons. But this is very interesting because this was a huge theory back when Call of the Dead released. And as you know, with Black Ops 2, we eventually did end up getting the double pack-a-punch abilities where you pack-a-punch certain weapons a second time and you'll get random attachments. And I like to think that the community during Call of the Dead had a pretty big hand in that. Another thing that Call of the Dead lies to us about is that during the intro cutscene, all of the weapons that are seen you can't actually use besides the sickle. You don't get the sawed off shotguns, unfortunately. You don't get the pitchfork. You don't get any of the cool weapons you see besides the sickle. After Call of the Dead, it was really up in the air on what exactly happened to the characters we play as, and we really never knew for the longest time until Revelations where we got this radio. It's been six weeks since and the rest of the Call of the Dead cast and crew went missing. Hollywood's lost its fucking mind with this story. An entire production vanishes? Crazy talk. I told you, this is why you don't shoot in Siberia. 
I saved it. Agent on line one, manager on line two. I needed to sort this quickly. I'd rather have zombies come for me than an agent. That's real horror. I don't need that. Also on Call of the Dead, have you ever been really annoyed with George Romero? Especially when he slams his light down and electrocutes you? Well, there is a bug that you can do that will completely negate that effect, and it's pretty simple to do. All you have to do is wait until you get an insta-kill, and during an insta-kill, you want George to electrify a zombie, so have him slam down on the ground and electrify a zombie, or the zombie can already be electrified, it doesn't matter. And while on insta-kill, all you have to do is melee the electrified zombie, and bam, th that's it. George's electric attacks no longer have any effect on you. He can still hurt you, like if he comes up to you, he can still hit you and everything, and he can still shake your screen, but when he gets near you and tries to slam down and give you a little electricity, that will no longer affect you. And it's so easy to do that you could pretty much do this almost every time you play Call of the Dead. The Call of the Dead easter egg is very interesting because you can do it either solo or co-op, and the solo and co-op steps are vastly different but yet also not. The solo one is so easy to do because it takes away majority of the co-op steps. The first two steps are going to be the same. You're going to want to knife the door and get the fuse. And then step two, you're going to want to destroy some generators. Step three is where things get a little bit different. On co-op, you're going to want to get the vodka. And in solo, you skip pretty far ahead in the Easter egg and you go all the way to the control switches on the boat. And for solo, once you've done that, you can go right to the end with the VR-11 and the zombie and getting the Vril device. While with co-op, you still have to do the foghorns and you still have to do the lighthouse dials. So I will give Treyarch credit for trying to make solo easter eggs more of a thing, but I wish they wouldn't have cut out so much of the easter egg. And speaking of the easter egg, after you have completed it, you will be rewarded with a Wonderwaff. And then from that point on, every time you kill George, you will also get the Wonderwaff instead of the Death Machine. But to make the game a little bit fair, the Wonderwaff will only deal one point of damage to George Romero. Instead of doing its infinite damage against zombies, it only does one teeny tiny point against George, so it is effectively one of the weakest weapons to use against him. Now if you didn't know, there was a mobile app called Call of Duty Black Ops Zombies, and in that app they released a map called Call of the Dead Director's Cut, which is a pretty different version of Call of the Dead than we normally see. Instead of featuring the celebrities like regular Call of the Dead, it just features the four originals, Tank, Nikolai, Takio, and Richthofen. And of course, because of that, the Easter egg was removed, and also the scavenger was not in that version, and George Romero looks pretty different. And in my opinion, the mobile app, he looks terrifying. Like if I saw this thing running at me at night, I think I'm just gonna let him kill me. I don't wanna live knowing that this horror lives in the same realm as me. They definitely did a fantastic job on the app with how creepy George Romero looks. And also besides George, the scavenger, the Easter egg, the characters, there's a couple differences here and there with the overall map layout and where barricades are being placed. Here's something that you may not have known. Watch my points carefully. When you turn a zombie into a human with the VR-11 and he starts running away, you will gain 10 points for every zombie that hits him. Now I know it's not a lot and it's really not a game changer, but I still think it's very interesting that the VR-11 might not be as useless solo as you thought. I mean, I know the whole get rid of George thing, but like for high rounds, it's pretty useless. Another little interesting thing that you might not have known about the VR-11, if you shoot a zombie three times, we all know it explodes. But if you shoot a zombie twice as they are spawning in from the ground, they explode. So instead of shooting them three times, you just have to shoot them twice. And also, if you shoot a zombie twice, they're not going to explode. They will just run into the water. But right before they freeze, they will explode and take out, you know, any zombies with them. As long as you're not like on a high round, because as we know, that explosion is pretty bad. But I feel like this is something a lot of people don't know about the VR-11 and actually makes it a little bit more interesting. You can still gain that explosion effect even without shooting a zombie three times. And speaking of wonder weapons, once you get the Wonder Wolf in Call of the Dead, you're going to be able to kill a total of 180 zombies. And as you know, once you get the Wonder Wolf, you can't really swap out of it. Like you're, you're kind of stuck with it until it's over. So like I said, 180 zombies, which is a pretty reasonable amount. But let's take round 50 for example. Round 50 has 249 zombies if you're playing solo, so you'd still have a lot left to kill. And this is just one of the many reasons why Call of the Dead High Rounds, well, solo-wise, is such a pain in the ass. Now, one of the more powerful special grenades is going to be the Matryoshka dolls. They do about 100,000 points of damage, with one doll being able to kill up until round 57, while if you can manage to get all the dolls hitting one zombie, it'll be able to kill until round 72. 
so the Matryoshkas are very, very powerful. But unfortunately, they were nerfed against George Romero. Matryoshkas will only deal 5% of their total damage to George, so in theory, they will only do about 20,000 points of damage. And in case you didn't know, for every player that's in the game, George Romero has a quarter million points of health. So 250,000 with one player, half a million with two, and so on. So I guess to balance things out and make George not so easy to kill, they had to nerf the Wonder Wap against him and the Matryoshkas. The official Call of the Dead summary reads as follows. It's anchors away for mayhem, and this epic tale of survival inspired by the legendary writer and director George A. Romero, a group of four fearless explorers fight for their lives amidst an army of bloodthirsty Russian zombies. The story begins with our heroes stranded in a frozen wasteland of a forgotten Siberian outpost. On the hunt for the origins of the enigmatic element 115, they head for the site of the ancient meteorite impact crater, but their ship mysteriously runs aground. In the midst of a horrific snowstorm, our intrepid adventurers inadvertently unleash an unearthly horde of ravenous zombies. From the island's deserted lighthouse to a shipwrecked ocean liner and a precarious zip line in between, it's kill or be killed. And with shiploads of zombie Russian soldiers, scuba divers, and sailors that rise from the frozen ground and icy waters, it's not going to be easy, especially considering the deadly surprise that one particular and somewhat notable zombie has in mind. Now, up until the release of Call of the Dead, one cool thing that the celebrity cast did was do a bunch of interviews about their characters. And I went through and watched every single one and picked out some of the more interesting bits. It's going to be a part of history. I mean, it's, uh, and it's, it's almost corny to say that a video game is going to be part of history. But this is one video game that has really pushed the envelope as far as the technology, you know. And, and uh, it's amazing, you know, to what they've done, you know. And I look great. <laughs> it's a great feeling, especially the fact that my character looks the best, you know. <laughs> I got these two badass machetes, this big bandolero going across with bullets and a rifle and uh, uh, pretty buffed up, so it's like really cool. <laughs> well, you know, it's like I said, I always bring the badass, but uh, I'm amazing with a machete in this, like uh, you've seen me before. And... Uh, I think I've got a huge machine gun also that I just play with once in a while. This thing's like a pea shooter. Vale madre. Are you kidding? This thing's like a baby's toy. Watch out, zombies. I'm uh, coming for you. I met George at uh, uh, several uh, of, of the big conventions at Comic-Con and uh, over in Europe. And uh, I'm a huge fan. It's really an honor, you know, to be in this. And he's sort of, um, George is sort of our puppet master, you know, for uh, Sarah Michelle and, 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 and Michael Rooker, you know, uh, Danny Trejo and myself in the game, you know, in the Call of Duty. He's sort of, he's kind of our puppet master. There's a movie within a game element to it, uh, which I like, uh, which one of the things that attracted me to the project. And the way George fits into that part of the game and the puzzle and the conceit, I think, is very, very clever. Who can't resist the lovely Sarah Michelle, you know, running around with her midriff exposed, you know, doing those high kicks, you know, and chops. I mean, that's, that, it's going to be real fun just to pick her avatar only because she's so hot, you know. You know you're looking at, at me and Danny between the two of us, you know, we got more ravines and valleys and crevices in our faces, you know, than the Mojave Desert, you know. But uh, you're going to have to look at us an awful lot. But it's fun. You Play Robert England. See where it gets you. This is a nightmare. Let's bring it louder. Okay. And then as soon as you impale, it's a, ah, like right on the impale, because we're going to pause it right on the impale. You want to do a freeze frame of that impale and try to recover? Oh, right, exactly. We're going to. I am a zombie killing machine, baby. Well, let me tell you, after doing The Walking Dead and then getting the call to do this, I'm like, I'm, uh, I'm walking on a cloud, you know, because this is very, uh, very much like having a continuation of, of The Walking Dead almost, you know, you're in the same frame of mind, um, and you're killing zombies, and, and my guy, Merle Dixon in, in The Walking Dead is a, a kick-ass zombie killer. He loves this stuff. 
So and then get up and get ready. Exactly. Bring it up a little bit more. So like about here. Yeah, yeah. So you're nice and tight, ready to start okay. shooting any kind of zombie that's coming your way. Yeah. So that ain't in the script. That ain't in the script. Okay. okay. Like the face you made, that's perfect. Yeah. And then bring All right. it up and be tense. Okay. All right. Let's try one more walkthrough. <clears throat> that ain't in the script. Oh, I'm incredibly familiar with Call of Duty uh, prior to doing this. The very first, I'm trying to think, it was the first day I moved into our house. I thought we were having an earthquake, but it turned out to actually just be my husband playing downstairs. And I ran downstairs thinking our whole house was shaking, but he just had the volume all the way up. He is a, a very big fan of Call of Duty. I'm excited. I can't wait to actually play myself. Does that sound? That probably doesn't sound very good, huh? Um, also, the opportunity to be the first female playable character, I mean, for me, Breaking stereotypes is something that I love to do and to show that women can be empowered. And I think there's a misnomer with gamers that it's all boys and all men, but women play too. And I think it's really important for us to have characters that we can identify with and that we can relate to. Okay, zombies, time I crank this up a notch. It's a party. A hunting party. Girl with a shotgun. How's that for a movie idea? And I don't care what anyone says, Sarah Michelle Gellar is not Buffy. She was Daphne from Scooby-Doo. Quick, we need to think of a comeback. What hey, shut up! Now, Shangri-La does have a first when it comes to zombies. It holds the title for the first female zombie in Call of Duty, and that's coming off the back of the first female playable protagonist in Call of the Dead. And I mean, hey, who said Call of Duty isn't progressive? Now, Shangri-La is definitely one of the more harder maps to get to high rounds on, not because of the lack of a wonder weapon, but mainly because of the enclosed spaces and the lack of traps. But one good way to turn the environment against itself is by using the napalm zombie. If you can make the napalm zombie explode, it will leave a little fiery patch on the ground that will pretty much insta-kill any zombies that run over it. Unfortunately, it does not kill everything. Shrieker zombies and the zombie monkeys are unaffected by the fire. But still, if you play your cards right and you use the napalm in a very advantageous position, you can pretty much wall off an entire section of the map and get a lot of zombie kills while doing it. Now also one thing that I think a lot of people might not know about is the Shrieker Zombie also has a very similar effect. If you can manage to get a headshot on the Shrieker Zombie, all nearby zombies heads will start to explode. And the reason I think a lot of people may not know too much about this is because one, you need a headshot. Two, the Shrieker Zombie is affected by insta-kills and nukes. And three, when he's running at you, he kind of likes to stay in the middle of the pack, so it's very hard to get a headshot on him. But like I said, if you can manage to get a headshot, all nearby zombies' heads will go... One of my favorite things about Shangri-La definitely has to be the minecart. One cool thing about it is if a zombie stands on the minecart as you take it, the zombie will come for a little ride along, but he's not going to try to attack you or anything. He really just sits there and chills with you until the end of the ride where he gets flung into the wall and meets his end. But it could have been just so easy for Treyarch to just make him disappear and respawn in later and not take the entire thing with you. And that's something that I really like. Another interesting part about the minecart is if you go down on the minecart, you're not going to go with it. So it's going to look like you're still at the start, but once the minecart is finished with its track, you'll just teleport to the end of it. So if you are playing co-op, you can kind of use this to your advantage if you go down in a certain area you could just have your friends start heading to the end of it and wait for you to teleport there. Now, the zombie spawn system is very, very interesting. So there can only be a total of 24 zombies on the map at any given time. And if you have 24 on the map, once you kill one, another one will spawn in to take its place if there are still some more zombies to spawn in during that round. And on round one, a zombie will spawn in every two seconds. And with each round after that, the spawn delay is decreased by 5% and it does eventually cap out at 0.8 seconds, so not even a second. And you eventually reach that at round 64. So the zombies will officially be spawning in as fast as possible on round 64. One of the more cool visual aspects of Shangri-La that I really enjoy has to deal with the spike more. If you place down a spike more and it explodes and hits a zombie, but that zombie doesn't die, that zombie will still have spikes going through them as they run around. And it would have been so easy for Treyarch to just make those spikes disappear or just not even appear at all, but I love the attention to detail and I love how if the zombie can survive it, it's still going to have those spikes all over its body. Now, if you ever wanted some more information on the Shangri-La story, well, similar to Call of the Dead, Revelations gave us just that with these radios. So I started with a simple one. Something about two guys named Brock and Gary looking for a car for. They finished like... 
Next thing I know, I'm in this jungle. And it's hot and humid, and the sky goes black. Like, dark black. I look up. There's an eclipse, and these things start chasing me. Like zombies. Trust me, I know how it sounds. I've been fighting them so long now. I should be dead. In fact, I'm pretty sure I have died. But it just keeps going. I've started setting up these traps. Pretty damn proud of them, if I do say so myself. Wait, I hear something. Can't help but think they hold some kind of key clues. We should investigate the stepped pyramid for some clues. I think we should get the hell out of here while we still have the chance. But Come we're so on, close to proving the existence of- ah! Ugh, finally. Sorry, the only thing more annoying than the undead are those two guys, whoever they are. Anyway, I've been trying to get some bars on myself for days, and I'm having no luck. I swear, if I die a few more times, I may actually lose it. At least then I'll have those agents off my back. Now, if you're wondering who this random woman is, this is Sally. This is George Romero's assistant, and we do have a, a little bit of information about her. On April 11th, 2011, following the disappearance of the Call of the Dead cast and crew, Romero's assistant, Sally, begins to search for her boss. Her journey leads her back to Shangri-La during an eclipse, which sends her back in time to April 25th, 1956. And on April 25th, 1956, at Shangri-La, explorers Brock and Gary discover Shangri-La, during an eclipse, they're unwittingly trapped in a time loop. Sally, sent back in time from 2011, is trapped in the same loop. Ultimus arrives in Shangri-La, and with the help of Brock and Gary, they acquire the Focusing Stone. Ultimus gets onto the teleporter, but Dempsey tries to use the 3179 JGB215, aka Shrink Ray, on a zombie, causing the teleporter to overload, sending them to the Pentagon. So unfortunately, Sally's fate is similar to that of Brock and Gary, stuck in a never-ending time loop where all that awaits her is death. Leading up to Moon's release, they definitely had some of the best trailers, and the trailers that I'm talking about are the Zombie Lab trailers. These things were so good. Not only did we get to see the wave gun in real life, but they're just littered with little references here and there, like the mystery box, the power switch, and just tons of weapons that we've seen in zombies so far. And I'm really upset they didn't push more with the Zombie Lab stuff, because these trailers are freaking awesome. Here at Call of Duty Zombie Labs, we have the world's foremost zombie experts working tirelessly to develop and perfect zombie killing techniques. Recently, we've discovered a zombie population on the moon. This meant our team needed to do some unconventional research. What we're doing here is something special, getting to know zombies inside and out. We're seeking answers to questions like, how do zombies explode when there is no air? How does the vacuum of space affect the zombie's appetite? We're constantly developing more advanced weaponry and innovating zombie defense methodology and we will continue to help people stay alive and kill zombies in the most inventive and effective ways, no matter where they are. Here at the Call of Duty Zombie Labs, we've initiated phase two of our low-G undead research. We're probing even deeper to find out what makes these zombies tick. Our intensive research has generated some mind-blowing answers to questions like, how do zombies react to the moon's low gravity? And how do they hold up under extreme G-force? We're working round the clock 
to make sure everyone can hold their own against the zombie onslaught. Because you're not truly alive until you're out killing the undead. Now, statistically speaking, the wave gun and the dual wield zap guns are one of the best wonder weapons in Black Ops 1 Zombies. But unfortunately, it does have a major downside. It will never create drops. So unlike the ray gun or the scavenger, for an example, those things can create max ammos, insta kills, carpenters, or double points, or anything like that. Unfortunately, the wave gun and also the thunder gun in Black Ops 1 do not have that ability. They will never create drops for you. So that's why going to high rounds on moon is a little bit more tedious than other maps because you don't have traps and you can't create max ammos. Yes, you can hack things to get a max ammo, but the main wonder weapon itself will never create drops for you, so it becomes a little bit more tedious. Not saying it's impossible or hard, it's just that you're going to have to be swapping it in and out of the box once you really get up to higher and higher rounds. And another little fact about a weapon that a lot of people may not know, when it comes to the QEDs, zombies can actually kind of screw you over. So one of the QED's effects is a curse. You'll throw out a QED and a red money symbol will pop up. And if you grab this, you lose money. But say you're smart enough to know that I shouldn't grab it. Well, here's the kicker. Zombies are able to pick it up for you. So if you toss out a QED and it gives you the red money symbol of death and you're like, hey, I'm not going to pick that up. Well, make sure the zombies also do not run near it because they'll end up grabbing it for you. It's not like they're going to purposely run after it, but if you happen to train them into that, they will get it for you. And you're going to lose some money. Another little tiny part about this map that you may not have known is that Speed Cola does affect the hacker. Speed Cola will make you hack things a little bit faster. It's not like in an instant. Like you're really not going to notice it. Like if you were reloading a weapon, you can definitely tell if you have Speed Cola and if you don't. But with the hacker, it's definitely not as noticeable, but it still does exist. So if you're starting up Moon and you can only get Speed Cola off the start, you know, sometimes it's not so bad. Especially once you get the hacker, you can get some doors open a little faster for a little cheaper. Now when it comes to the astronaut, he can be very, very annoying, especially as you get to higher and higher rounds, he becomes tankier and tankier, and he's just a real pain in the ass to deal with, especially because, for me, he always likes to steal my juggernaut. I don't know what's up with him in that perk, but he loves it. But there is a way to deal with him that's very, very easy. There is an astronaut glitch where if you're jumping on the jump pads at the start of a round and he happens to spawn in while you're jumping on those pads, he will get stuck in place and do this little dance move. And as long as you do not get close enough to him for him to grab you or damage him a lot so he starts moving or kill him, he will be there for the rest of the game. It's best if you do it earlier so he's not as annoying, especially once you get to those higher rounds or if you're trying to do the Easter egg. And like I said, it is a glitch, but I'm going to go ahead and consider it canon. Another little astronaut fact that I really couldn't find much information on, but I heard somebody say it, so I'm going to believe it because it's the internet, and who would go on the internet and tell lies? And that is, if you kill the astronaut, it will change the order of the excavators. So the excavators come at random times, and I'm assuming with each game they're going to have an order, so this one will come first, and this one, and this one, and it's just all kind of completely random with each game. Well, if you kill the astronaut, I do think that changes the excavator's order. So if you've ever gotten like the same excavator five times in a row, Maybe it's because you keep killing the astronaut and you keep resetting it. So maybe if you're trying to do the Easter egg and you're trying to get that Donald 6, maybe leave the astronaut alone. Don't risk it. Don't try to change up the pattern or anything. Just let them come and deal with them as they do. And speaking of excavators, once an excavator has announced that's going to be breaching a certain area, you have exactly four minutes to deal with that. And that's actually a pretty decent amount of time to make your way to the hacker if you don't already have it, and then make your way to spawn, whether you're either teleporting or if you're just running all the way back there on foot. But just remember to keep a mental note of that. Once you hear that it's coming, you only have four minutes until it gets there. In Black Ops 4, we did get a little bit more information about the astronaut zombie, because in Black Ops 1 Moon, it's really up in the air. We don't really know much about him. But in Black Ops 4, it was revealed the astronaut zombies are failed attempts by Dr. Schuster in sending astronauts to Griffin Station as test subjects to establish a link from Groom Lake on the map classified. Log entry 97, August 3rd, 1963. The matter transference device has been realigned, again, in order to accommodate additional temporal variables. This is test number 11, human subject 5, one Private Hastings. If the transference specs are correct, Private Hastings will arrive at Griffin Station on August 3, 1963. If he arrives at this date, a communication link will be successfully established and we will have confirmed that the teleporter's temporal anomalies have been compensated for. Are you ready, Private Hastings? Yes, sir. I can't understand a word of what he's saying in that ridiculous spacesuit. A simple thumbs up will suffice, Private Hastings. Good. 
Initiate the transference matrix. Moment of truth. Dr. Richards, did it work? Do we have a stable connection? No, sir. Nothing. We've lost him. <sighs> That's the fifth man we've lost. This base is rapidly running out of privates. Oh, I suppose they're all just dancing around on the moon somewhere in the far future, having a grand old time! Wait, wait, what, what's happening? Richards, what did you do? Nothing, sir. Something's coming through. Hit the alarm. Get me, Pennell. We need soldiers here immediately. Who the hell are you? Where did you go? Wait. No. No, no, no. It's not possible. So it only took a couple games, but we finally did get a little information about the astronaut's backstory. Now, one interesting thing about Moon is definitely the gravity lifts. They randomly turn on and off in the biodome, and occasionally a power-up will spawn on them. It'll either be a double points, carpenter, nuke, fire sail, or insta-kill, and all of these power-ups will alternate on the gravity lift before it eventually disappears. And if your end goal is high rounds, that insta-kill and nuke are definitely pretty valuable. The last useless fact I got for you guys is going to take us all the way back to Kino Der Toten. In Kino, as you are on your way back from Pack-a-Punch, sometimes you'll get teleported to a random room, and in these rooms, you can pick up a film reel. And if you go back to Pack-a-Punch, you can place that film reel in the projector and it'll play various radios. Well, one of those radios sounds like this. Another setback. Patient 26 was killed this morning in a field test. He lost control and attacked one of our handlers. His injuries were minor, but patient 26 was destroyed. The break in programming coincided with the flashing lights and loud noises of the fire alarm in the test facility. One moment. What is it? And what's interesting about that radio is if we go all the way to Revelations, Revelations actually gave us a continuation to that. The break in programming coincided with the flashing lights and loud noises of the fire alarm in the test facility. One moment. What is it? You wanted to see me, Ludwig? Sophia, yes. Do come in. Sit down, my dear. Have some tea. Is everything all right? No, no. Everything's fine. Drink your tea. I heard a nefarious rumor earlier regarding the field test with Subject 26. Are you feeling all right? Of course. Just strange, this rumor. May I see your arm? What? No. Why do you need to see my arm? Relax, Sophia. I would never hurt you. You know that, right? Of course, but... And you know I care deeply for you. Yes, but... Yes, yes, yes. Then you know everything I'm about to do is for your own good. And through all those radios, we learned that Sophia was actually at Kino der Toten, and Subject 26 had actually managed to attack her. After many weeks of failure and frustration, Dr. Maxis finally achieves the breakthrough he had been searching for. The results were immediate and startling. In the case of Subject 26, his instances of violent outburst were non-existent. His docility appeared. Permanent. Unfortunately, while we prepared to implement the treatment on the other subjects, there was an incident. During his field test this morning, Subject 26 attacked a handler. 26 and the handler were both destroyed. Maxis believes Subject 26 only attacked the handler. He does not know I was attacked as well. I have observed a developing pattern of high fevers and cold sweats. My thoughts are erratic. My relationship with Ludwig is complicated. I fear I cannot keep this secret from him for long. Thus giving us a little bit more information about what exactly was happening at Kino der Toten, and it kind of gave us the build up to some of the events that happened in Gorod Krovi. And stating that, I am all out of useless facts. That is going to be the video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. And if you guys did, hit that like button and also leave a comment on what your favorite useless fact was. Or if you know of any useless facts, 
let me know. And also, thank you to my Patreon supporters. They get videos early and are just better than everybody else. So an extra special thanks to Brian Hahn, Person Person, Dirty Dan, Fat Lucky Potato, Icy Storm, B Rad the Man, Giovanni Diaz, Orte Burgos, Dr. Dopey, Mayall, G Daddy Smackdown, Forg, Mr. Ridgeway, and Henry Heiberg. If you would like to be a Patreon supporter, link is down there below in the description. And that is going to be the video. Leave.